God used to dwell in a house among his people. But now he has a home that's better than the first. It doesn't look like a building with a steeple. Now he's living in the people of the church. Brick after brick, God is building his temple. Brick after brick, he's making it strong. With Christ the sure foundation and his people as the stones, he is building a place he can live. Brick after brick. Before I get started, um, earlier this morning, I was uh, listening to Robert uh, Jeffress, and he was uh, apparently retelling it, what was an old story, even though I don't remember hearing it, um, about Alexander the Great. And apparently, Alexander the Great had a, a soldier brought to him for some real disciplinary reasons. There's several different versions of the story that I was able to find. But uh, the point is, the soldier's name was Alexander. And the king said, the name is Alexander. You need to either change your behavior or change your name. And that kind of applies to what we're going to be talking about today. There are expectations of someone who calls himself Christian. Most importantly, there are expectations from Christ himself. So let's get started. We're going to take our lessons from Romans today. We're calling this Make No Provision. Romans 12 to 14 has a ton of fabulous useful information for Christians. It starts off with the most basic thing of how we should think. What should be going through our mind? What should our minds be focused on on a daily basis? As a result, knowing that what we know, how we should behave, and also importantly, how we should be together with each other. I want to take a quick cruise through here and give you a few examples. It says we're not to conform to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewal of our mind. We're told not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to, that our love must be sincere, that we should bless those who persecute us and not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good, to obey those in authority. To sum up the law in a command of loving your neighbor as yourself, to put on Christ and take off evil, not to quarrel with each other. Not to judge a brother or sister harshly. Not to be a stumbling block to them. All that inside of a couple of chapters. There's a lot of sermons right there, and you've heard many of them over the years. If you're looking for a good refresher course on how to live the Christian life, that's a good place to be. So here in chapter 13. Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy. What is he talking about? He's saying that old expression, when in Rome do as the Romans do, he says, don't do that. Don't live like them. You're supposed to be different. You are to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. To put it another way, don't let yourself think about ways to indulge your evil desires. So when we talk about making no provision, making no provision for sin, from the Greek pronoun, forethought, foresight, provision for, providence, which is from a root pronio, forethought, providing for, and practicing. Some of the commentators explain it this way. Benson says it's to raise foolish and sinful desires in your hearts when they are, or when they're already raised, to devise means to gratify them. Finding ways to justify doing the wrong thing. Having a bad idea in your head to begin with, where it all starts. Matthew Henry says two things are forbidden, perplexing ourselves with anxious and cumbering care, and indulging ourselves in irregular desires, giving in to that bad side of ourselves. See, our minds serve our desires by default. So it's very easy to set ourselves up. Now, 
kind of go out on a limb here and then say that in some cases at least, someone's sitting there saying, well, he's not talking about me because I can handle things. I've been a Christian for a while. I know what's what. I don't have to worry about that. So on behalf of pastors around the world this morning, let me just say, yes, I am. We're all at risk of falling at any given time. I'm talking to every one of you, myself, my wife, Rev, and his wife, and everybody else in this building and in every other church building this morning, just to be clear. Why do you think the Lord's Prayer says, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil? Do we need to be delivered? Apparently so. Human nature is a funny thing. I don't know how many of you are familiar with a program called Ice Road Truckers. This is the craziest way to make a living you can imagine. They go to the worst possible places in the middle of winter with ice all over the road and go sliding around on it to deliver to some village miles away from any sign of civilization. They drive over frozen bodies of water and everything, and every once in a while, one of them goes through. It's nuts. Here's a highly experienced, mature driver got stuck in the snow. And as I'm watching him go along, he understands the risk, of course. This guy's been driving for 30 years. He knows he's driving too fast for the road that he's on. He understood that. He even commented that they'll have a guy riding in the truck with him with a camera and a microphone and everything. He's like, yeah, you know, this is very slippery. And he's, he's struggling to keep the truck on the road. So he still drove unsafely in spite of the hazard, in spite of acknowledging it. Why? Because he was motivated by something called the dash for the cash. This is all about, their season is only a couple of months long. So they've really got to go for it. The more dangerous it is, the heavier the load, the more money they can make. Some of these guys can make 60 grand in a couple of months. Some of them can make 100, some even more, if they're crazy enough. While I'm sitting there, as he's going along saying, well, this is pretty, looking pretty dangerous here. I'm like, well, in about two seconds, you're going to be in the ditch, so you won't have to worry about it any longer. You'll have it confirmed. No, no sooner was it out of my mouth, boom, right in the snowbank. I'm like, dude, I don't know anything about trucking, but I knew you were going in the snow. I could see that coming. What made it worse is he just got through helping somebody else out in a very similar situation the day before. Have you learned nothing? Have we learned nothing over the years, spiritually speaking? Why do we make these kinds of mistakes? Why do we even do it after we've advised somebody else on the same kind of mistake? And then we do it. The first thing you got to understand is it's not somebody else's fault. Any decision that you make at a given moment is made by you. The devil didn't make you do it. For whatever he puts in front of you, for however he tries to communicate with you, he can't make you do anything. You have to decide to cooperate. You made a decision. And it might be a quick decision. It might be one you make without hardly even thinking which is the most dangerous kind of decisions, right? But, you know, take heart. Some uh, famous people, famous believers have made mistakes every bit as bad as anything you've ever done. We talked not too long ago about Moses. And he lifted up his hand and he struck the rock with his staff twice. And the result was not good. Why? Because he was angry. Just doing what God told him wasn't good enough because he didn't do it the right way. He didn't do it with the right heart bad decision, and he suffered the consequences for that. King David, we know how he made provision for sin, don't we? He saw from the roof a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. Now, at that point, he sees the snowbank, hits it anyway. King Solomon, famous example, he was specifically granted extra wisdom from God. He asked for it, and he got it. He wrote wisdom literature in the Bible. So not only was he wise, he was able to pass his wisdom on. He still got tripped up by making provision for sin. He fell victim to PSM. Who knows what PSM is? Power, sex, and money. The three things that get so many people again and again and again. First King says the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing. Don't say I didn't warn you. That he should not go after other gods, but he did not keep what the Lord commanded. 
No thanks, I'm just going to steer right into the snowbank. You can be intelligent and still lack wisdom. You can be wise and still act foolishly. Trust me, I've done it many times. Ecclesiastes 10 says, Dead flies make the perfume as ointment give off a stench. So a little folly outweighs wisdom and honor. Doesn't take much. John Gill says, A good name is like precious ointment, valuable and fragrant. Sin, which is folly, is like a dead fly. Not only light and mean and base and worthless, but hurtful and pernicious. She's not just about you. It's deadly, the cause of death, and what may seem little, a peccadillo, or however a single act of sin, may injure the character of a wise and honorable man. All those years of good deeds and good works and success, in a moment, gone. That's what people are going to remember. This may injure the character of a wise and honorable man and greatly expose him to shame and contempt and cause him to stink in the nostrils of men. That expression, how the mighty have fallen. A couple of occupations in particular come to mind. As you guys know, I have experience with both. You can have a 10, 15, 20-year career in the police force. Make all these arrests, save all these people, do all this good, and then one day make that one mistake. All that's forgotten, and they want your head, and they're going to have it. Uh, I can remember a conversation I had in the station one time with a couple of guys, and we had a couple of female officers there too, and they're going back and forth and everything else. You know the old expression, nothing sacred in a police station. So you can imagine what kind of conversation it was. And I said, took one of the guys aside later. I said, you know, you're really kind of pushing it. And I know I've been here for the several years. We've all been saying all this crazy stuff. But one day you're going to come in and do that. And she's not going to be feeling well. Or she's going to be mad at you for some other reason. Or you're going to say something that recalls something in her life that's hurtful. One way or another, things are going to go downhill. And those last five years aren't going to matter. It's not going to matter what you said to each other all that time. What's going to matter is what you said to her today. How many times have we seen great preachers fall from the pulpit? Success with preaching and serving God for years and years and years, and then suddenly Satan gets his foot in the door, and it's all over. Sometimes these guys will try to recover, try to come back, try to make it right, but usually that doesn't work out very well. It's the little stuff that gets you that you don't even see coming sometimes. The Song of Solomon says, cast your foxes first, the little foxes that spoil the vineyards, for our vineyards are in blossom, or, or the jackals is another way to translate it. The small things that can spread like fire. Everybody's familiar with the flower, national flower of Scotland, the Scottish thistle. It's quite a thorny little thing. Someone once traveled to Australia from Scotland, and they took a little bit with them. And... They planted it, and it started to grow a little bit, and everybody said, oh, isn't that cute? You know, a little something from there. Well, next thing you know, there's a good section of Australia that's loaded with Scottish thistle, and it's all they can do to try to control it. Oops. Something interesting from uh, Charles Stanley said years ago, the word halt. He said, don't get too hungry. It's funny how if you get hungry enough, you might say or do something you normally wouldn't because now you're not just hungry you're irritable i can be cranky enough but i'm worse and when i'm hungry <laughs> don't get too angry anger fuels itself the more angry you are the more angry you're likely to get till it's out of control and you've said or done something you can't get back we know what's happened to people who've gotten too lonely Speaking of Solomon and whoever else, although why he, would, why he would have been lonely, you wouldn't expect that, right? But you know what I'm saying. There have been plenty of lonely people who sought solace in the wrong place. Don't get too tired. Overexhaustion will weaken you too. And these are just little common sense tips for everyday living. This isn't the answer to the whole thing. 
But I thought these were pretty handy because how often have we made some of our daily mistakes, committed some of our sins under these circumstances because one or more of these things were in play. Now, we always have this, this kind of interesting question. We talk about how we've been empowered to resist sin as believers with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and yet believers still sin. See, there's an escape route. There's an exit that you can take. But sometimes you've got to be fast. We know in 1 Corinthians it says, He will also provide the way of escape from temptation so that you will be able to endure it. Sometimes that exit comes up pretty quick. That window can be pretty small. And if you just kind of look in the other way a little bit, oh, didn't see it. Oops, I did it again. Don't miss your exit because you weren't even looking for it. One of the excuses we hear today, as far as I'm concerned, is just an excuse that today is different because today's methods of communication are so different. There's so many, you know how the, the expression, the a lie gets halfway around the world before the truth can get its pants on, right, with all this high-tech business. But are we really any different? Is the world really any different in terms of Christians being tempted to do what offends God? I don't think so. If anybody should have known better, it would have been Paul. And he said, I don't do what I want. I do the very thing I hate. Oh, that's frustrating, isn't it? Let me tell you, the basketball court can be a very frustrating place. I've been going there for like a year and a half now. The thing that annoys me the most is when I get up there, let the ball go, and make one of the same mistakes I did the first day I started going there, before I started watching all the YouTube videos, getting all the instruction, practicing, seeing progress, getting better, saying, hey, I'm finally getting the hang of this, and then I'll make the same mistake four times in a row. I'm like, what is going on? Makes me crazy. Why can't I get four good ones in a row? Because that's, that's human nature. We, we make mistakes, and we tend to repeat our mistakes. We tend to forget our mistakes sometimes. Now, this isn't an exact analogy, but the principle is the same. Our mistakes frustrate us. Our repeated mistakes particularly frustrate us. And we've got to watch for that and take steps. I know how to fix it. I know the reason I'm repeating that mistake is because I got a little frustrated after the first one. And I didn't just relax and do what I'm supposed to do. So that's why I repeated the mistake. That was my fault. So we say, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the thing that's going to get us through that. Specifically, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. Putting something else first before God. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. And these you too once walked when you were living in them. He's talking to the Colossians here. But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Boy, have we ever had more of all of that than we do today. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator, like we saw in Romans. The instruction is simple. Put off the old self and put on the new self. Shove that bad side of you aside and encourage the good side. Let's talk about Zechariah's vision for a minute. Now Joshua was standing before the angel clothed with filthy garments. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. And I said, let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments. What's going on here? You can't wear the uniform of the enemy and the uniform of Christ's army at the same time. You've got to take a side. Don't take sides against each other. Don't take sides against people who don't agree with you. Take sides against the devil. Take Christ's side. Well, let's have a look at our sin excuse list for 2023. Turns out it's the same one that we used in 2022, 2021, 2020, and, you know, well before that. I just couldn't resist. Yeah, you could. You just didn't. Come on. Who do you think you're talking to? It was the circumstances. No, it's not somebody else's fault. It's you. 
Well, at least I'm not as bad as, ooh, don't even go there. Not in front of me. Don't go pointing your finger at somebody else. It could have been worse. So it's not bad enough? It's just the way I am. Well, now this one's got a little truth to it, doesn't it? We have particular problems, particular tendencies. So if it's just the way you are, do you just hang it up and go, well, that's it? No, you don't. You say, I've got to pay particular attention to this because that's the way I am. And I don't want to be that way. I don't want to have to write 2024 on this list. And the one that makes me crazy, so don't ever say it to me. It's what everybody else does. I don't care what everybody else is doing. I care about what I'm doing. I care about what you're doing. I don't care what other people are doing. They're doing it, and they're getting away with it. doesn't excuse you or me. That's just it. So take this list, rip it up, and throw it away, all right? Walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. We must not allow our self-centered humanity to overcome our Christ-centered spirituality. You got to make a choice. You got to pick a side. It's the little things every day. Horatius Bonar said, a holy life is made up of a multitude of small things. So what do we do? We do what it says in Colossians 3. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. Uh, wait, let me check. No, it doesn't say fighting and arguing and annoying each other to try to win an argument. No, it doesn't say that. It says teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. Singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Hey, that's what we do here. That's a fun thing, right? You can do it outside of church too. With thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Put on your Christian glasses first thing in the morning as soon as you get out of bed. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. Don't let Satan get his foot in the door. Don't shoot yourself in the foot. You've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who's angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So, if you're offering a gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. Familiar passage from 1 Corinthians. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. Why am I talking about communion now? Because of the guy, I heard a story about a guy who had a 10-year feud going on with someone else in the body of Christ. Since they weren't getting along, since we had this whole grudge thing going, he rightly didn't go to the communion table, didn't, didn't uh, receive the elements. Well, that's good. But here we go again with doing something for the wrong reason. He saw that as a point of pride, as a sign of his spirituality. Well, I haven't gotten along with this guy for 10 years, so I'm not, not going to take communion. Well, aren't you wonderful and holy? How about making up with this guy? Did it ever cross your mind to do that? Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in the spirit of gentleness. Hello? What are we doing here? If we're going to act like that, we might as well stay home. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires, we would hope. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. A little instruction to the Galatians. What a shame that we should see every one of these things in the church today, division, arrogance, jealousy, selfishness, self-righteousness, pride, anger, and grudges. In every church in America, I guarantee you, you can find these things, including this one. Don't borrow Satan's darts to throw at one another. Isn't he doing enough damage without your help? Jesus knew what he was doing when he prayed for us and said, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. So there isn't any dead flies or any of that smelly business going on when people look at us. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but 
also to the interests of others. And back to Romans, for those who live according to the flesh set their mind on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. Make that choice. We have indeed been given power to sin, to power over sin. Let me say that again. We have been given power over sin, but it only works when we choose to use it. Watch out for your weak areas. You know what they are. When you do trip up, move immediately to repentance. I've had my days where I was a little embarrassed to go back to God. You, you sort of stall a little bit because you're a little bit afraid to face them. That's a huge mistake. Do it right away. Don't languish. God wants to be able to move on with you, so move on with him. As Paul said to the Ephesians, finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil instead of holding the door open for him. Jesus speaking again, the glory that you have given me, I have given to them that they may be one even as we are one. I and them and you and me that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me. Let's be strong together. Let's be strong together. Let's be strong together. Break after brick, God is building his temple. Break after brick, he is making it strong. With Christ the sure foundation and his people as the stones, he is building a place he 